Hello, uh, good evening. It's news at 10 on TV3. I'm Stephen NT. Let's start with today's major news highlights. One person has been shot and rushed to the Margaret Marquardt Catholic Hospital at Prando following a shooting incident at Alavano Agoma. The victim was allegedly hit by a bullet in his house during sporadic shooting by some unknown assailants in the town. And some fisher folks in the Pando municipality are unhappy, saying the ban on fishing, the poisonous puffer fish is affecting their business. Meanwhile, the Pando Municipal Assembly has warned of stiffer punishment to anyone who flouts its directive to ban the sale of the poisonous puffer fish within the municipality. And after intense lobbying for major constitutional amendments to be effected in the MPP's constitution, expectations of many have not been met as the party have had to defer to the next extraordinary Congress for these major changes to be made. For stalwarts campaigning for positions, it offers them an opportunity to go another round canvassing for votes. And farmers and residents along the wide Volta in the Upper East region have been advised to stay off the wide Volta river banks until the dam spillage is over. The Bagre Dam is expected to be spilled within the next few days. And Nadmo says it could take three days for the flooding water to reach the catchment area. Those were our major news highlights. Remember, we're streaming on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. Let's begin the tonight's discussion on uh, News at 10 with issues of mental health care in Ghana. The Mental Health Authority has over the years appealed to Parliament to pass the legislative instrument, LI, on mental health. The LI is to give legal backing to the Mental Health Authority uh, for it to function effectively after five years of implementation of the act. The law provides for the establishment of the Mental Health Fund, uh, which court is to provide financial resources for the care and management of, of persons suffering from mental disorders. Right, uh, so tonight uh, we have in, in, in our studios uh, Humphrey Coffey, who is a country facilitator, mental health leadership and advocacy program and executive director of the Mental Society of Ghana. I'm grateful to have you. Thank Good you very evening. Much. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Now, Parliament passed the Mental Health That's Act true. in uh, 2012, uh, uh, several years on. The legislative instrument to operationalize it uh, uh, to operationalize and make it effective has uh, not been uh, forthcoming. How worrying is this? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, if you understand what it is to uh, have a, an ally to the parents' law, which is the regulation mm. to the parent law, it'd be basically saying that the ally is going to give administrative directive to the parent law, that is the uh, mental health law. Now, within the context of the LI, so many things that are in the parent law that cannot be really administered because of mm. um, the fact that the LI is not in operation um, leaves much to be desired. Because if you talk about compensation for nurses who suffer any um, serious damages as a result of um, maybe a parent, um, sorry, a, 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 um, a, a patient uh, um, hurting him or her how much compensation will be worked out for him or her. All these things are supposed to be spelled out within the, the framework of the ally. Mm. Again, if you're supposed to fund mental health, where is the source of funding? How much of the VAT is supposed to be uh, charged for mental health specifically? If you look at what is happening now and where the stage of the ally is, what we are left to 
do and to get it laid in parliament is how much of the VAT is supposed to be levied so that it is given to mental health to increase the funding component of mental health budget in Ghana. Mm. So one of, of, of all these things that are happening, do you get the impression that the challenge really is uh, attitude? No, we keep getting back to this whole thing. For example, if a legislative instrument is enforced to, uh, it's in existence to, yep. to make the, uh, the act itself effective and that is not there. Do you get the impression that it is the lack of commitment from everyone, including policy makers and, and uh, the nationals? Certainly, you rarely hit the nail on the head. Um, it's about um, political commitment. I mean, how, to what extent is government committed to ensuring that mental health becomes something that everybody, even at the community level, has access to um, quality mental health services. Because if we are really serious to get this thing underway, I'm sure by now it should have been completed, laid in parliament for 21 days, mm -hmm. and it should be effective. I think that there's not that much commitment. And again, it makes people uh, who are suffering this combination go through worse situations. Because um, if you also look at what we propose in, in the Chris, uh, Chris uh, Kumi um, committee that examined the various, uh, that reviewed the National, National Health Insurance um, uh, Scheme last year, the committee came up with a report. I mean, the stakeholders agreed that mental disorders should be part of the National Health Insurance Scheme so that people suffering from such conditions will get. As at the, as at the time the report was submitted, uh, we realized that issues of mental disorders were not on mm. the list. I, I, I am interested in that a little bit. Uh, the mental health treatment under the yeah. NHIS. Yeah. How crucial is this to the overall problem of lack of uh, commitment to mental health? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, if you examine the mental health policy in Ghana, it says that mental health services shall be free. So, of course, the policy says that it's free, but you will not get the medication where you go. I mean, it will be prescribed for you. You have to go and buy. Even those ones that the patients have to buy, there are a whole lot of fake ones within there. Mm. So government actually is supposed to ensure that there is free supply of psychotropic medicines to make the policy effective, which is a free. But it's not there. If you go to the, any of the hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, you have to pay for it. So what we are saying is that all these mental disorders should be put on the National Health Insurance Scheme so that the issue of patients going to the hospital and not get the medication shall be a thing of the past. But if, if it is on the uh, National Health Insurance and some of the medications yes. are taken care of by NHIS, how helpful would that be overall to the solution? Yeah, just like any other condition that is on the National Health Insurance Scheme. If somebody is admitted at the Ankafu Psychiatric or Pantan, wherever, or even any of the units, psychiatric units within the polyclinics or the the regional hospitals, the person should be able to get as many medicines that he requires. Mm. If he's supposed to get Medicaid injection, he's supposed to get whatever uh, medication that is required will be provided readily because it is available or it is on the on the on the list of uh, conditions that the national. And it is have. your impression or estimation that this will go a long way in helping mental health challenge. Very much so, to the extent that even at the chip zone. At the chips zone, which is a, I mean, the minimum level where um, health services are provided in Ghana, people who suffer mental health conditions can get the medicine free and we don't have to come to any of the three psychiatric hospitals. In Ghana. I know stereotypes and things have been a critical role in uh, defining how we Ghanaians perceive mentally challenged people. Uh, from, from where you stand, you are an expert, how bad is the mental health problem in Ghana? Well, um, um, let me say that it's, it's really bad. Um, the media, we work with the media and sometimes we hold some trainings for them to be able to use the appropriate language when mm. describing people mm. with mental disorders. Mm. I mean, we have had several of such uh, trainings, uh, the Mental Leadership and Advocacy Program, the Mental Health Society, Basic Needs, among other stakeholders mm. have held several trainings for them. But you still see or hear that the words that are so derogative that worsen the stereotype situation of like mental, madness yeah, madness or boredom and all that you know instead of saying that the person is suffering from a disorder you know because any other person could suffer any of such conditions so mm -hmm. we need to 
really wake up to the core of making sure that we use the appropriate technology, the appropriate language when describing inside people. So you get the impression that these stereotypes have been reinforced That's by true. the media's inability to That's use the appropriate words. I mean, I, I use an example of... Uh, HIV. I mean, in the time when the HIV campaign, starting from the Ghana Social Marketing Foundation That's and right. all of that, there were scaremongering approaches which uh, made uh, people see HIV, uh, people who are living with HIV That's as true. sick and maybe uh, dejected. They don't deserve to be in society. You think that's the same problem that is going along the line of mental health? It's the same. It's the same. Even within the Ministry of Health, uh, mental health is not really treated as mm -hmm. one of the serious areas as in reproductive health, malaria, etc., etc. Within the uh, nurses, the doctors themselves, they themselves have over the years um, stereotyped those who work with the nurses. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody enters, the, for instance, a facility and the person is suffering from a mental condition, say, oh, uh, I'm down for a nurse. No? So such descriptions, <laughs> you know, has, has made integration of mental health into our primary health care system quite Very difficult. difficult. And that is worsening the situation. There's also the uh, heavy debt uh, on the shoulders of the psychiatric facilities. Uh, how is that impeding uh, health care delivery when it comes to mental health? Yeah, so indeed, if we are able to um, bring mental health down to the chip zone facility, mm -hmm to the extent that people will not have to travel all the way from the look and carry of this country to access mental health facility in any of the three psychiatric hospitals. What it means, therefore, is that it's going to reduce the number of people. And in any case, the way forward is community care and institutional mm -hmm. care. So then it will reinforce what the mental health law itself is saying, that the way forward is community care, so that people are treated within the community. They stay within the community. They are already in the community. It doesn't happen that they are moved away from the community and have to reintegrate, which is with a difficult. You speak about the way forward being community care, but how crucial will community care be in tackling the deficit of uh, mental health uh, and the attention given from health authorities? Yeah, um, indeed, if we are able to ensure that even those um, um, health providers who are not necessarily psychiatrists who are in the district hospitals and the, and the chief zones are provided with some training that will enable them to identify cases of mental disorders, not necessarily treat them, but identify them and make the appropriate referral. That will go a long way to improve um, mental health services within. Because we, we cannot get the human resources to all these uh, ch uh, chip zone facilities, etc. But at least we have primary health care uh, providers who can have some uh, basic training that will enable them to identify cases of mental disorders and refer them appropriately. And you think this is what we need as that a country? That is it. That is it. Now, let's uh, finally, uh, before we make you go, we've, we've seen that over the years there have been uh, commitment, different levels of commitments with various uh, governments and leadership. Do you get the impression that uh, this new government under the new uh, health ministry and the health minister uh, are showing or giving off the posturing that they care enough to make a difference, to change things? Yes, um, let me say that for now we have not seen significant changes in terms of mental health because the issue of uh, shortage of psychotropic medicines is still, we, with us. is still with us. I mean, medicine, medicines such as olazapine, uh, etc., are really, really in short supply. That was the perennial shortage we were experiencing in the past, and it's still there. Now, apart from that, the issue of um, some of these hospitals running into debts. Of course, they are already in debt, but worsening the debt situation of this hospital hasn't changed. And the debts are not reducing. And the debts are not reducing. So we need to find a way of ensuring that some of these things are reduced. And we, once the numbers reduce from the hospital uh, facility mm -hmm. and are treated in the community, it will go a long way to reduce the death burden at the psychiatric hospitals. So the Mental the Health numbers. Society of Ghana, you, you, you've you enumerated a lot of problems. Uh, have you been engaging uh, the relevant authorities, uh, the health ministry, and pressing for some of these changes you, you want to see in the yes, um, mental health? Yes, Mental Health Society, yes, we have. In fact, um, we have, um, together with basic needs, and then uh, the Mental Leadership Advocacy Program, um, delivered um, a kind of a kind of um, letter to the minister mm -hmm.
telling him that there are, we, and we enumerated quite a number of issues, including the establishment of the uh, um, Mental Health Authority Board. I mean, the board that is supposed to run the Mental Health Authority. As we speak, there is no board that is directing the authority. We are thinking that even on the board, there should be a user, somebody who has experienced mental disorders, that can, who can contribute to at least, because all those people whose names are going to be mentioned on the board are not people who have experienced mental disorders. They will just speak either from the books or from what they've heard. Right. But we think that people who have experienced it can tell the story better. Mr. Humphrey Coffee. Thank you very We're much. We're grateful, grateful extremely uh, for your time. Uh, Humphrey Coffey uh, joined us there. I'm Stephen Enti. Hum Humphrey Coffey is actually the uh, country facilitator of the Mental Health Leadership Program, Advocacy Program, and also the Executive Director of the Mental Health Society of Ghana. I'm Stephen Enti. Remember, we're streaming live on our Facebook page. Let's get interactive. We have more news for you. Please stay. Welcome back. Now, government says it is struggling to pay an amount of 892 million cities owed waste management providers. Water Resources and Sanitations Minister Joseph Kofiada expressed optimism if these debts are settled. It will improve waste management in the urban areas. This debt accrued from the provision of various services such as fumigation, compensation for JIDA, and sanitation guards, the provision of landfill management services, as well as debts arising out of contracts with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development and the Municipal, Metropolitan, and District Assemblies. Interrogation of the 892 million cities, I say, yes, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're trying to make sure these are debts we genuinely own that we have to, to pay back. The Ministry has also been able to complete a draft policy paper for the approval of Cabinet to establish a national sanitation authority with a supporting sanitation fund to serve as a dedicated agency to regulate and lead the implementation of the sanitation policies of government, as well as provide reliable and regular funding to support effective service delivery. The policy also makes provision for the establishment of a dedicated enforcement team under the authority to be called National Sanitation Brigade that would ensure compliance to lay down laws and regulations. Let's get on to the telephone lines. Atai Hain is Vice Chairman of the Coalition of Non-Governmental Organizations in Water and Sanitation. Konewa, sir, good evening, sir, and thank you. We're grateful you could join us. So these debts, uh, how bad are they? I mean, when I say how bad, really, how bad is this if affecting uh, sanitation across the country? Hello, Mazai. Hello, Hello yeah, Can you repeat your question? I am I am asking that these debts, uh, 892 million cities old waste management providers by government, how bad is it? How is this negatively affecting uh, sanitation improvement across the country? All right, thank you very much. Um, let me say that this is one of the major issues that have affected sanitation delivery in this country. But it has been with us for a very long time. And like the minister rightly said, because we have this debt, you are not able to get the service providers to mobilize to go and clear the waste that is piling up in our cities. And so it is very, very bad. And until we mm. settle them and pay them, the waste will continue to be. But, 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 but I'm curious, Ms. Ahina, I, we need to have a better understanding of how this 892 million CD debt was. Uh, accrued. I mean, how did we get here? You know, it, you know, it's always been an agreement, government and the service, service providers, that you provide me with this service, and I will continue to pay. Sometimes, when they don't have the funding, they live with them, and then they are able to provide the service. Then the debt is silent. They live with them until it becomes so huge that the service providers cannot also pay without being paid. That is how we have come to this this point. And you see, as a country, I think that we should begin to have a plan, a plan to address the bad sanitation situation in this country. I mean, you talk to every sector player, and it seems as if we know our problems, we know how to solve them. But again, government does not even commit 0.25% of GDP to sanitation, which is appalling. 
And if you continue to behave like this, you will continue to live in very poor sanitary conditions. But let me say that I, I like the commitment of this minister. I think that he's taking the right step. But again, I, is it going to be sustainable? That is the question we have asked ourselves. And if we will allow sector players to make concrete inputs into our approach, then we should be getting somewhere. Mm. I, I know that uh, the, the, gov the minister himself has uh, raised concerns about this debt, not necessarily uh, to suggest that government is unable to pay, but there are subtle suggestions in his commentary to indicate that some of these debts might not be genuine. Uh, how have you been able to, as uh, sanitation <coughs> waste providers, been able to reconcile who genuinely is owed what amount? Um, Stephen, you know, we are a coalition of NGOs in water and sanitation, a non-governmental, non-partisan organization. So we do not have the details, and we do not want to okay. conjecture. But we will certainly go into it, and once we make some findings, we will be able to talk to you and give you um, concrete Right, facts. that's that's very fair. Are you also able to tell us uh, what has come out of the policies by the uh, various assemblies to ensure that private uh, refuse collectors register and charge households for waste generated? So, and I can tell you that it has been very challenging. You know, sector players have always complained that different assemblies do and this assembly are not as committed as we want them to be. And that is why we have such serious sanitation problems. We go to the assembly and we have all the fine policies, all the blueprints, mm. but we are unable to implement them. That is the challenge we have. And you see, these are people who also have political implications and all that. And so we think that this assembly should be more committed. If they need support from other players, I mean, they should talk to the sector players and we'll be able to support them. Right, but uh, so far, we are, not, we are not very happy with the way we are handling our sanitation situation in this country. Right. Uh, Ms. Atahin, we're grateful for your time. Ms. Atahin is the Vice Chairman of the Coalition of Non-Governmental Organizations in Water and Sanitation. Konewas, let's move to the Volta region, where the Asogli State wants to partner the Tourism Ministry to improve tourism in the whole municipality. At the launch of the 2017 Asogli State Yam Festival at Ho, organizers called for deliberate efforts to rebrand the festival to serve as an avenue for job creation. The modern day Asogli State Yam Festival began in 2013 when Togwe Apodo, the 14th, ascended the throne as Agbogbo Mafia of the Asogli State. The objective of the celebration is to thank God for a bumper harvest and successful year, to remember and pray for the souls of the ancestors, to offer prayers for good life and prosperity and foster unity through forgiveness and reconciliation. At the launch of the 2017 edition in Ho, the planning committee is confident the festival will remain a focal point of tourist attraction in the region. Over the years, the Asogli State Yam Festival has grown from just a mere commemorative ceremony to one that is serving as a catalyst for branding and marketing Asogli State to the outside world. Who has now become a destination of choice for regional, national, and international conferences and meetings. This development has also brought to the fore numerous job and employment opportunities, as well as boosted commerce and trading activities, leading to the increased number of banks serving the booming economic environment. Two flagship programs will be rolled out during this year's festival. The launch of the Medical Aid Fund and the Maiden Summit of the Ever Kings from Ghana, the Republic of Benin, and Togo. 
The three-week-long program, which started with a hike through the Galankwe Mountains, will be climaxed with a grand deba on Saturday, September 16. The theme for this year's celebration is the role of tradition and culture in governance and national development. And one person has been shot and rushed to the Margaret Marquardt Catholic Hospital at Pando following a shooting incident at Alavanyo Agome. The victim was allegedly hit by bullets in his house during sporadic shooting by some unknown assailants in the town. The incident reportedly occurred around noon Sunday at Alavanyo Agome in the Hohoe district of the Volta region. According to eyewitnesses, there were sporadic shooting into the town by unknown gunmen. The Odikru of the town, believed to be in his mid-60s, was hit in the back as he attempted to run indoors following the spate of shooting. He was rushed to the Margaret Marquardt Catholic Hospital at Kwando, where he is receiving treatment. The Kwando Divisional Police Commander, Superintendent Prosper Alija, confirmed the incident on phone to TV3, adding, the police has begun investigations into the shooting. He also appealed to the people to assist them with information that will help track down the gunmen. It will be recalled that on renewed clashes between Alavanyo and Nkunya resulted in killings between April and May this year, claiming six lives. However, there was fresh shooting in Nkunya Asachiri on August 14, a day the paramount chief of Alavanyo was visiting Nkunya towns in a symbolic peace building gesture. And as usual, no one could trace the whereabouts of those who carried out the Monday, August 14 shooting that injured a young lady in the leg. It is not yet clear if the Sunday afternoon shooting was in retaliation to the Nkunya Asachiri incident. That's how we draw the curtains for News at 10. I'm Stephen Enti. Thank you for staying with us. Enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Uh, there is more news at 3news.com.